those guys got to wear a USA helmet. That's all I wanted was to get that opportunity and, you know, just became addicted to riding my motorcycle and feeling that escape that they talk about in the movie. I'm Talon Sinkson from Howell, Michigan. Currently uh, grew up in Howell, but have lived in Northern Michigan the past couple years. Um, basically got into dirt bikes from birth. Uh, six months after I was born, my parents were camping at a dirt bike race um, like they had done. My dad started riding when he was mid-20s, um, and that was kind of just what him and my mom did. Uh, they went to dirt bike races because they both lived away from their families, so they you know, needed something to do. So from super young age, we were, we were at the races around dirt bikes, around motorcycles. Um, my grandpa on my dad's side, he was a big street motorcycle rider. Um, my mom's side, a lot of motorcycles involved. Uh, so it was kind of just walked right into it. Um, started riding at three, did my first race at four, I believe. Um, 24 now, so 20 years of racing dirt bikes so far and life is good. Yeah, that's that's great. Was was the uh, place that you grew up? Was it that actually Jack Pine with uh, where Travis, our mutual friend, went? Yeah, yeah. So uh, went to Jack Pine. My parents became members, I believe, in two thousand, probably two thousand eight ish. Uh, so we started going there um, as kids. We'd spend you know a week at Lansing Motorcycle Club up in Northern Michigan for. Years and years, uh, you're kind of out in the middle of middle of the woods, no service, no access really to anything as kids, and we just rode dirt bikes, lived outside for the for the week, and you know it was like an escape. Every summer, you'd look forward to it. And, you know, it was riding dirt bikes with your family, had try to have some friends up, and truly really the best way to grow up. Yeah, I actually got the chance to go up there and camp. We went this year and went last year, and it's it's really cool. They have, uh, you know, they have their own private property. It's like a private campground that the the club owns, and they put on the event called the Jack Pine, which maybe we could dive into later. But my kid is almost is going to be turning three in July, and they actually had one of those electric, uh, like yeah, dirt bikes for kids. Um, so it was really cool getting getting her on that we had to balance her but she handled the throttle and was able to turn really well um and they even put on events for kids where yeah. the kids can rip around this little wobbler track they called it and it was just it was really cool it's, it's such a great time going up there and and we've kind of considered joining the club if only for that if, if only to like have our kids grow up in an environment yeah. like that because yeah because we're we're outdoorsy as well and i don't know I love that. You know, we get to disconnect from our phones, as you said, and introduce our kids to the outdoors and these these motorsports that we love. Um, yeah. So that's awesome. Um, how did how did you growing up with that evolve over time? Because you've you've done a lot of very competitive races these days, and um, you know how did how did you decide to take that to the next level, or when did you start competing? Yeah. So as a kid. Um every every good parent should show their kid on any Sunday when they're at an age to understand it um, so it's basically it's probably an 80s movie about motorcycles uh, all different genres of motorcycling um, racers uh, kids you know BMX flat track all these different types of racing and my dad you know put that in the VHS player for me and you watch it and you know you, you become addicted to it as a kid and then as you get older you see these events on there and you know there's desert races there's the Baja 1000 there's you know all these different events um, and to me the coolest one was the international six-day trial that they called it at the time but now the international six-day enduro um, the coolest part for me was those guys got to wear a USA helmet or whatever country they were from, they got to represent their country and they were the baddest dudes in their country if they got to go. Um, so from a young age, I that's all I wanted 
was to get that opportunity and, you know, just became addicted to riding my motorcycle and feeling that escape that they talk about in the movie and how there's, there's no other way, no better way to spend a Sunday than on a motorcycle. Um, so that, I would say that movie and then also a movie called Dust to Glory, uh, which is about the Baja 1000. Um, there's a guy they highlight in that movie who does the Baja 1000 on a dirt bike all by himself. Uh, and I always wanted to be like him. So I haven't done the Baja 1000 yet, but the, the long distance enduro events are, you know, kind of, kind of something that have always had a rope around me and keep pulling me in. So that I would say that, that that's the primary factor of what got me hooked on it. Um, Okay. Another thing, though, is my dad did try to qualify a couple times when I was younger. Um, and seeing the other guys, like the professional guys who were also there uh, racing for their professional spot, kind of had the same effect on me. Like, I want to be like that. I want to I want to get this opportunity to represent my country. That's great. Uh, before we dive into that event uh maybe you can for the audience and for myself because i haven't i haven't had anyone on who's talked about enduro dirt bike racing uh maybe you can kind of go into what like what is enduro racing like what what entails that what are the different types um yeah yeah so it started off um basically it's it started off as an endurance event all types of off-road dirt bike racing did um, so you have like your track stuff, which is motocross. Um, those guys do, you know, two 30 minute motos or two 40 minute motos or whatever. Uh, so enduro basically is you take a 60 mile loop through the woods and in the, the old school days, they would have a schedule that they would have to keep two for that whole 60 mile loop, uh, a schedule with a speed average. So if they had a speedometer on their bike, they knew that they needed to stay at that certain speed for the entire time to drop the least amount of points as possible, which is basically how early or late you are to checkpoints uh, scattered throughout that 60 miles. Um, You don't know where these checkpoints are in the traditional style of racing. So you're kind of just watching your clock watching where you're at on the course the entire time to stay on schedule. Um, Enduro nowadays has changed a little bit. They still do uh, five to 10 of those events each year, Um, roughly, or they call them timekeepers. Um, But now they have what they call restart format or uh, sprint enduro or special test racing. And that's where you have a loop set up, you know, similar 60 miles to way more. Um, And throughout that loop, you have uh, special test sections, which are three to 10 mile sections where you start at a certain time. Somebody lets you go and then fastest time through that six or three to 10 miles wins. And then they add your special test sections up throughout the day. you are still trying to keep a time schedule on that loop, but it's a little bit easier because you have more time added in to give you a break before you start off those special test sections. Is there, is there any bike restrictions? I know that you had to have special, special parts and gear for the bike. Uh, so yeah, does it, does it depend on the race or is it all pretty common amongst all these enduro races? Uh, for the most part, an enduro race, you're going to want a spark arrestor. Uh, that is usually required by either the state's government or local trails or whatever. Um, the U.S. Forestry Service kind of implements those rules. Um, so that that's the most basic one that is pretty much required everywhere. But some races require headlight, taillight, and license plate. Um, we are lucky enough, living in Michigan, to have... Uh, ORV legal roads in most counties where you can ride on the side of the road without those requirements. Um, so all you need is your ORV like trail stickers. But some states do require headlight and taillight to go on the roads. Um, and then overseas is similar, headlight, taillight. Uh, and then just your basic protection parts on your bike just to keep it safe for those 
long days. I mean, you're going through a sort of terrain of rocks, roots, logs, all this stuff that you could encounter. So you want to protect your bike and your body as best you can. That's, that's really interesting. Cause we're both in Michigan and yeah, we're, we're kind of blessed with all these, these natural trails in upper Michigan and in the UP. So you can go a large distance without ever touching a main road, but for a dirt bike to be an enduro, to be street legal, you have to what, have a horn, blinkers, headlights, license plate. Yeah. And it yep, sounds so like awesome. if you're racing in an area where you're going to touch a main road, you have to have all those so that you're not getting pulled over by the cops during, during these events. Yep. Is that pretty at, accurate? At very, yeah. At the very minimum, it's headlight, taillight, license plate. Uh, the rest of the stuff, like you can use hand signals. Um, technically you should have a mirror and it can be, it can be enforced. Uh, some, most places don't enforce it, but it is a possibility. Um, but kind of add to add in earlier to the, the Lanty motorcycle club up in Northern Michigan, they, they are responsible for a lot of those trails being where they are. Um, so kind of to add into that earlier point, like where you said, joining the club, they, they advocate for us to ride these trails and ride on the side of the roads and get these laws and legislations passed. Um, so when, when you say, you know, thinking about joining the club for, to have what you, you have up there, it, it, it helps so much in all different aspects too, of riding a dirt bike in Michigan. Um, just being a part of a club like that, that's, that's really progressive and getting us out there and getting trails for everyone to ride. Yeah, and I, uh, there's just like a little funny tangent. I had a neighbor when I lived in, like, kind of in the city. He had, a, he had a mini bike that he made street legal so he could ride it on the, you know, 55 mile per hour roads down mm -hmm. near Royal Oak. And uh, it, it's like funny what you can get away with. You said you can use hand gestures for blinkers and whatnot, but you had to have a horn to get around. And all he did was he took one of those, like, air horns, the, the squeeze, like, yeah. honk horns. And yep. he said that was enough for the the cops or whatever to pass inspection and let him drive that thing on the road. I always thought yep. that was so funny. Um, yeah, that, yeah. That's, uh, we've gotten a couple bikes listed as street legal, and that's pretty much what we do for a horn. Put one of those on, and the cops usually just sign off on it, and they're like, hey, it's legal. It makes a sound. So, <laughs> kind of funny. That's, that's great. So... We can dive right into this ISDE, which stands for the International Six Day Enduro. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a background on this event? And, you know, you said from an early year, you've always wanted to do this. It sounded like your, your dad and some of your you know, family friends grew up and actually did this event. Um, yeah, what does it entail? And, uh, you know, what, what goes into qualifying for this thing? Yeah, so um, ISD started in 1913 um, in England. It was called the International Six Day Trial. Uh, they kind of called enduro racing trials back then, um, but it evolved into the International Six Day Enduro. Um, every country does their qualifying process a little differently, um, but basically you send, you know, er not every country, but most countries send teams. Uh, so you have a trophy team, which is your professional guys, the best of the best. You know, they're getting paid to be there. Your junior team, which is same level, but under the age of 24. Uh, you have a women's team in most countries. Uh, U.S. has a very strong women's team. And then the club team is like the amateur guys like myself who are just going to represent their country, basically. Um, so the way the qualifying process is nowadays is you go to a qualifier. There's an East Coast qualifier and a West Coast qualifier. Um, this year, the qualifier was in Maryland that I went to. Um, and you race a sprint enduro, which is basically only special tests. Uh, you're not on a long loop. So you're just doing the same two special tests over and over throughout the weekend. Um, and that's, it's, it's a little bit shorter, a little more economical, not as much logistics are required to do that. So you can basically just see who the fastest riders are. 
Um, for the club team spots that I was competing for, they take the top seven riders from those two days. Uh, so they take seven from the East Coast, seven from the West Coast. And then there's a couple people who are selected uh, as replacements for the professional teams, the trophy and the junior trophy. Um, and then there's like occasionally a senior team, which is uh, now it's 35 plus, I believe, um, which still very fast guys, uh, but they're super experienced and they can kind of lead the younger guys who are, you know, first time qualifiers. They can lead them through the race or kind of give them tips and tricks and whatnot leading up to it. Um, so yeah, they, you get top seven from there, you get a phone call like, Hey, uh, what do you, do you want to re uh, represent the United States basically? Um, to weed out who is trying to qualify and who's not before the race, they do a letter of intent. Uh, so you pay 75 bucks, you fill out a letter from the American Motorcyclist Association, uh, the AMA, basically stating that if you are selected, you will agree to go. Um, and then like that you are willing to pay the fees that are associated with it and whatnot as an amateur, because it's a super expensive event. Um, but yes, yeah, so they, they give you a call after the race. And if you say yes, the, the whirlwind starts. Um, you have to get a bike to whatever country you're racing in. Um, so they offer various rental programs, but most guys buy a bike, put it in a crate, and then ship it over. Um, takes roughly three months. So you have to have everything ready three months in advance to a shipping container in Ohio, where they put everything in the container, put it on a boat, send it over. Um, and th those logistics thankfully are handled by the AMA for the most part, um, for a fee, obviously. But the rest of it is just fundraising uh, for your flights, your hotels, um, anything and everything you could need to have the proper support and equipment there that you'd need to race for six days. So th there's nothing with enduro racing in like the Olympics, but this kind of seems like a, it's an international event. Like how many different countries are competing in this? And oh. is it similar to qualify for them? It's kind of bizarre to me that you literally have two chances or two locations to qualify for this. The United States mm -hmm. is pretty big. I don't know if places in Europe, they just have one spot or maybe it's, uh, you know, easier to walk on because it's a smaller team. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, I'm glad you mentioned the Olympics because that's, that's what they call it is the Olympics of off-road motorcycle racing. Um, you have... I. I don't even know how many countries were there at the last one. I think I want to say it was around 30 at the last one I did. Um, I mean, you've got people from Israel where, you know, certain times dirt bike racing is not even allowed, but they're living in Europe so they can form a team. And, you know, the, you've got all these people who are going through a lot just to make it there. Um, but they, every country is very different. Um, I've met some German folks who they, basically say like, Hey, I want to do this. They tell their federation, uh, similar to our AMA that they want to do it. And then they help them get there, uh, help them with the logistics, but they don't necessarily have to qualify. Um, Australia is a little bit different. The Australian government funds their racing. Um, so those guys get selected by, you know, their federation and the government. Um, but there can be a lot of politics in getting selected to represent your country for, you know, six days of racing. So every country is a little different and every country has different politics that play into it. You know, people who have a history or people who are somehow tied into their selection committee can kind of influence how it goes. But thankfully the U S is very, very non-biased in comparison to most other countries. Um, our professional teams are a little bit more biased because one manufacturing manufacturing group supports the team more than any other. So they kind of have first say, but they also provide the most equipment, the most training opportunities, um, pretty much top-notch everything. Uh, so 
it's it's only I guess right that their riders are probably the best fit and the first selected. So, so you qualify and like how does the United States or the the US Motorcycle Association I probably said that wrong like what do they do to support you to get over there um it sounds like you had to cover a lot of the costs but they maybe have a you know a booklet of what you need to do now that you're in it but you did mention training and stuff so once you qualify are you kind of eligible for this training because they want you to compete and represent the country for them uh, training as an amateur, not really. Um, it's kind of whatever you can do and whatever you set up on your own. Professional, yeah, they're kind of pulled in and, you know, have set regiments. Um, but yeah, the AMA, the American Motorcycles Association, they basically, when you pay your fee, they offer all the logistics to get your bike over there, um, which is a ton. Like, I can't imagine doing that on my own. Uh, they get your bike over there. They get your bike from the shipping port to the race site. They provide, you know, a, a whole pit set up. Um, so they got tents, tools, uh, anything you might need during the week. They pretty much have aside from parts for your bike. Um, when you're over there, they provide gas. They provide transportation for your support crew to all these different pit stops where they can give you gas, food. Um, basically anything you need in your day-to-day -day racing, they provide, uh, they also provide a liaison between you and the FIM, which is the International Motorcyclist Federation, uh, rearranged for French terms, FIM. Um, so they, uh, they provide someone who can vouch for you, say if there's a rules discrepancy, a course discrepancy. Uh, you stop for a down rider, anything that could be in conversation between you and them, they, they are there for and to support you and, you know, kind of speak for you, which is nice. I wanted to cover this with the, you know, kind of the basic description of what an enduro is, but you kind of mentioned it. So I, I, I want to come back to it. Um, when you're doing these enduro races, like how many calories are you burning in a day, like how, what's the distance you're going, uh, how many calories you're burning and how important, or how do you keep up with that? Cause what I'm finding with some of these guests I'm interviewing who are, you know, pushing the limits, doing these marathon runs, these ultra marathons, um, you're just consuming so many calories mm -hmm. just to, you know, stay upright. You have to, you have to be mentally prepared, physically prepared, and then, keep your body fueled to get through these events. And I assume if you're doing yeah. this for six days, you're like, you know, on the brink of exhaustion towards the end of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So each day, I mean, you're doing roughly 150 to 200 miles a day, um, eight hours on the bike. Um, you might only do an hour and a half of racing each day, but in between those race sections, you're still on a schedule and you still need to go somewhat fast to get to the next point on time. Hmm. Um, but within that loop, you have, uh, what they call time checks, which is where, you know, it's, it's basically a time check where you stay on schedule. So you can either be there early and have time to sit around or you're late and then you get points added. Um, but at those time checks, the U S support crews there, they have food, gas, water, um, but like you're burning over 3000 calories a day minimum, um, just in riding. I mean, upwards of 5,000 and the first six days I did, I lost 15 pounds, um, in the week. So it's like during, during the race, you are eating as much as you can, uh, bananas, candy bars. Um, the biggest thing that I've learned from this is do it like your sugar intake is a lot more important than a lot of people think. Um, a lot of people think she's just water and protein. Um, but if you can get some sort of quick energy and sugar in you, you're, it'll kind of boost you to the next time check as best as possible. Um, so they're giving you like, you know, a little cup of Coke or anything with a little bit of sugar in it or like Snickers bars have some protein and a lot of sugar and some carbs and stuff. So 
anything to help you kind of sustain and have that boost to get to the next station, basically. Um, and then when you're done, the people in the USA pits, they have a full kitchen set up. So they're just making pasta, chicken, um, protein and carbs, basically. And then you, you finish the race, go straight there, you eat as much as you can, go back to the hotel, you eat again, and then you're going to sleep for the night, waking up bright and early the next morning to try to do it all again. It's wild because you, you know, if you're not familiar with this, and I'm definitely not, uh, you wouldn't think that you'd be burning that much calories sitting on a sitting on a bike with an engine, but yeah. you're so focused, you're, you know, your adrenaline's pumping, you're sweating your mm -hmm. ass off, like mentally you're all there. And yeah, that's just bonkers that you're, you're burning like 5,000 calories a day. Um, yeah. I try to tell people it's like, uh, it's like doing a, a squatted bent over row, you know, for four <laughs> hours. Um, you like, you know, you have, you have time to sit down every once in a while, but for the most part, it's, it's constant activity. And yeah, it's, that's a lot of people don't nuts. think about that. And I know that like hydration is massively important too. I, I did a yep. marathon run like a month ago, first marathon. And yes, the people that have done it in the past, they're like every mile, every aid station, at least take a sip of water. You need to stay hydrated. Yep. Otherwise you're going to fall apart by the end of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I, was, I mean, I'm not running a marathon and that's, that's way too gnarly for me, but yeah, it's, it's similar aspect of you didn't, you got to stay hydrated no matter how bad it sucks. You know, no matter how bad your body rejects it, you gotta, you gotta put something down. Nuts. So you qualify for this, you get your bike over there. Um, I kind of want to, can you give us just like a high level, what these six days consist of? Is it, is it more or less the same every single time? Um, where was the, what country were you in? Does it change every year? Yeah. So it changes every year. Um, I've done three, uh, Spain, Chile, and Italy. Italy was the most recent one in 2021. Um, so yeah, it's, for the most part, they do two loops a day. Um, so you have an 80 mile loop that you do twice or whatever from there. Um, so the course gets really beat up. Uh, you do two loops a day, usually do the same trail for two days in a row. So four total loops on the same trail. And then the next set of two days, you get a new trail. Um, there's roughly six to 800 racers. So, you know, 1600 people riding the same trail twice a day for two days. It's, it's like a bomb went off around the whole course. Um, so it's, it's roots, rocks, uh, mud, hills, anything and everything. Um, a decent bit of the racing action is like in, in fields in more open sections or like two track stuff through the woods. Uh, but a lot of the trail in between those special tests is like single track. Uh, you're, you're deep in the woods, uh, in valleys, um, or you're just riding down the highway. So it's kind of a, it's a big variance. Um, like Chile, we rode a lot of road and highway, but the highway down there was extremely dangerous and was probably the scariest part of the whole race. So it, it, it really depends on where you're at what you got to focus on. You kind of know coming in what's going to be hard, but you don't know how hard or, you know, how, how much of it they're going to put you through before they put you out on a road to kind of relax. The highway rides, are those in between checkpoints or yeah. is that a part of the race? No, that's in between checkpoints. So that, that's the, what they call the transfer trail. Okay. Uh, so they're just cruising you to the next trail or next race section. Uh, what, what is kind of the top speed of the bikes that you're riding? What is the, the size and the speed that those things can go? So I've raced a 254 stroke twice and that's like roughly probably tops out about 70 ish, okay. uh, with the gearing we have, but then I raced a 300 in Italy and that probably goes 80, 85. Um, so they, they're going pretty fast. Like you're going down the highway with trucks, cars, you know, everybody. Yeah. 
Um, so the, the reason I ask, the reason I ask is because my wife and I, we, we kind of grew up doing dirt bikes. And one of the coolest trips we'd ever, ever did was we went to Costa Rica and rented Enduros yeah. um, before kids just kind of toured the country on Enduros. And I remember feeling exactly the same way. Like riding on the highway was the scariest thing in the world. You're on this bike that's, yeah. you know, underpowered for the highway. Your top speed is like the slow speed of most people. And depending on the area you're in, like, I don't know, I don't know much about Chile, but, uh, at least in Costa Rica, they didn't give a shit about the bikers on the road. There was a semi truck no. that rode my ass and I guarantee he could not see my back tire. That was the scariest thing ever. I'm going to speed. I'm not even comfortable with. And if I make one wrong mishap that, that semi truck would just like hit a little bump and continue on. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I got I got pushed off the road in Chile by a by like a box truck. Uh, oh my god! I was he was merging on the highway and I was there and he just came over, so I like jumped into the jumped into the cement ditch and like rode out in front of him. But for the most part, since we we've been riding dirt bikes our whole lives, so we can maneuver fairly well if we get in a dangerous right. situation. But you know, some of these people do not care at all. Some of them are super big fans. Um, you know, they'll make way for you any way possible. But in South America, they, they could not have cared less. That's, that's not funny, but that's, uh, interesting yeah. that you've had a similar experience. Um, yeah, okay. So you're doing, that's on the list. That? That's on the bucket list. Costa Rica is on the bucket list. Oh now man. I, I, I was kind of inspired by a buddy I went to, I worked with and he's done it three times. He's done Guatemala, Costa Rica, and I'm blanking on the last one, but maybe Columbia. No, nice. I don't think that's right. Anyways, he, he's done three enduro tours through Central America. Yeah. And yeah, I'd highly recommend it. I mean, especially since you love the bikes and, uh, you know, I'm sure you like seeing all that stuff. So would, yeah. would recommend. Um, yeah. So you're doing, uh, when you're doing these loops, so you said you do two days, two loops each. Uh, that gets you kind of up to day six. Are these loops all in the same general region or are you traveling between hotels to get to the, the different spots within the country? Uh, no, so there, you have a, you have like a central point that you come back to every day. Um, and like we, we stay in the same hotel all the whole week we're there. Um, but like Italy, we rode different regions of the country kind of, um, they're very similar, but like, you know, you go over a couple hill ranges and they call it a different region. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it's, it's all the same area, you okay. know, hundred, 200 mile radius. Okay. Yeah. And I, I remember you saying in the pre-call that on that sixth day, so the last day gets a little bit different. So what, what does that entail? Yeah. So the last day is kind of like a, it's like a celebration day. Um, you ride you either ride to a motocross track or you start at one, like there's one at the central pit area. Um, and then you do like a five lap motocross race, you know, line up, you have 30, 40 guys on a gate, they drop the gate, uh, you all go together. And most, most of the racing is done by then because people over six days of racing, you're pretty solidified in your position, but some guys could be 10, 20 seconds behind the person in front of them. So they're really pushing to try to get in front of that person and make a gap and move up another spot. Um, the top 10% in each class get a gold medal. Um, or I shouldn't say top 10%, 10% of the winner of the class's time get a gold medal. So in some situations, that's like five people. Um, okay. It's very difficult to get. Uh, so a lot of guys are, are trying to get within that 10% and hoping that that guy who was leading, you know, might have a mishap and lose some time cause they can stay within that range. Um, but yeah, it's, it's for most people, it's just get through the day, get to the end, say you did it. Um, but kind of just depends on where you're at. Okay. When in the class that you were in, uh, yeah you've done this three times now and it sounds like you're, you're going to the qualifier for a fourth time. Is yeah. That right? So I, I tried, I tried for this year to go to Spain again. Um, 
which just was not fast enough. Uh, the hmm. level of the level of skill that has gotten an interest in this lately is grown a lot in the U.S., which is really good because we'll have a really strong team in the coming years. Um, but for guys like me who are a little bit older than the rest of the the competition, they're all in like the, they're eighteen to twenty range. They have a little, a few, a few less priorities. Uh, they can spend more time training, um, you know, spend time down south in the winter, getting getting used to going fast again. Um, but yeah, so I, I tried to qualify this year and just wasn't fast enough. Everybody else was going really fast, and it's it's either, easily the fastest group of guys I've ever tried to qualify with. <laughs> I I would bet that over time more people will hear about this and it just blows up i mean it seems like yeah it seems like a lot of these sports or a lot of these events that i've interviewed on they're getting more and more competitive and people are kind of finding their way into them so that doesn't actually surprise me that much uh yeah so i think a part of it too uh the u.s had never won as a prof- like the professional team had never won the the trophy uh or the the world trophy they call it um, up until 2016, when I went for the first time, that was the first time the U.S. ever won. Um, and then they won again in 2019, and then again in 2023. So when they win the next year, usually it's just a massive boom in people wanting to go because uh, it's it's just such a cool thing to be a part of the U.S. winning because it's still so special to them. Um, and everyone's like, you you don't know when it's your last, so. I love that. Is there, we've kind of gone through the whole event. Is there anything that you want to share from your experiences? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you want to go through kind of what went through your mind on these, maybe the first time versus the last time. Mike's open to just kind of talk through this event yeah. before we, we move yeah, on. So I, I guess I, I'll give some more information about it too. So the you go there for two weeks. Uh, your first week, all you do is walk. You walk your you walk every race section that you're going to race all the special tests so you're walking 80 or so miles the first week uh trying to heal up over the weekend and then going racing on monday for six days straight um so the walking for a lot of people is the challenge uh you know guys roll their ankle twist the knee do something like that and it can really ruin your whole next week so you kind of you have to walk because you cannot go wide open through a section or through a race section that you don't know um, and expect to be competitive. It's so like the pro guys are walking at each test two to three times. Uh, whereas us amateur guys, we have we have to go put our bikes together, uh, kind of take other stuff into account. So we, we usually get only one lap through everything. Um, and then the other huge factor is that you're self-supported. Um, you can change tires, uh, you can change certain hard parts on the bike, but there is a bunch of stuff that is painted at the beginning of the week. So you go into the race with those parts painted, um, those are your marked parts, and those cannot change or else you get disqualified. So your wheels, your exhaust, your engine cases, um, your frame, I think, I think that's it for marked parts, but you know, when you're riding 200 miles in a day, you burn through a tire. You can't just swap a wheel. You have to change the tire. Um, oh, so at the end of your day, you have a 15 minute work period. And you know, you just rode 200 miles. You rode eight hours on the bike. You have to change both your tires um, in 15 minutes. So it, it sounds it's got, it sounds weird, but you know, you can. You practice changing tires leading into the race, uh, so you can you can change two tires in 15 minutes and maybe get something else done. Um, but that's your that's your priority at the end of the day, and then you put your wheels back on, put everything back on, and then finish up your work in your your morning work period. So you have 10 minutes in the morning before you start to finish up any details that you didn't get done the night before. Um, so 25 total minutes of time of working on your bike per day is allowed and that's all you get. And Are these parts imported along with your bike when you ship it out? Are you responsible yeah. for all that? Yeah. So you put it in your crate with your bike. Um, 
And if you don't have it, you, you hope that, you know, some of the manufacturers are there supporting the race as sponsors. You hope that they have it. But if not, you, you got to learn to do without or improvise or, you know, cob something together off a different bike. So if you're having bike problems, there's a lot of MacGyvering going on, JB Weld, zip ties, you know, anything you can do to keep your bike going. That's nuts. Uh, I, is there anything else you want to expand on about, about the event? Otherwise we can dive into maybe some of the stories. I think you mentioned in the pre-call that you have a interesting story about one of the times you ran this. Yeah. I mean, event wise, no, uh, we, we can kind of go into each of the events and I guess talk about my first, my first one. I went as a 16 year old. Um, well, I let's had, do this real quick. Uh, what, what is the, the support and like the, the community with this i assume you're traveling with people but they're not allowed to help you but Mm -hmm. you are traveling with other people that you've met along the way or maybe you maybe once everyone qualifies you all get to introduce yourself to each other and uh like how's that been and you know how's that been for your career or your yeah just competing on a bike yes that's a good thing to bring up um it's like one of my best friends who lives in Oregon, he basically, we got to know each other because he started, I went when I was younger and he's a little bit older than me. So he started just grilling me with questions about it. Um, He invited me on a riding trip down South and then he started grilling me with questions. And then the next year we both decided to go um, and try to qualify and we both made it. So I got to know him extremely well, Um, him and his wife, my parents had gone to that one and then the most recent one my girlfriend went with us so like we all got to hang out for two weeks in italy and enjoy the the country but once like when you're trying to qualify you know everybody's competition you know you you have right. friends but everybody's racing for a spot to wear that usa helmet um but once you get there you know you're basically all just supporting each other it's not really a individual thing anymore it's it's a team sport um all the parents are helping the riders and if if you're going to be a parent who you know isn't going to help anybody else then you know it, it, it it's kind of like a karma thing if you don't help them then you're going to kind of lose your lose your friends in the race and you want to make friends um so yeah once you get there you know everybody's watching out for each other all the moms are kind of taking care of anybody who needs help and the dads are helping with the mechanical side of things like giving people advice giving bike setup tips um all that kind of stuff and then when you go home you know you know all these people around the country uh so anytime you go anywhere like if you're in their area they usually hit you up like hey come ride with us or whatever you need if you need a place to stay um things like that like it, it really just becomes a giant family of people who have gone um we all share the common like representation of the u.s and that family atmosphere i would imagine there's probably a lot of like pre-meetings and maybe a banquet at the end of it where you get a chance to meet Mm -hmm. all the all the foreigners so have you formed a lot of relationships with people overseas that you know there's no language barriers to yeah like uh one of the coolest ones when i was in italy last time where I was walking this test that was five miles, you know, the week before. And you see a lot of people when you're walking, but most of them don't speak English. Uh, this was a German guy. And we just, we talked for the whole five miles about like how his, like what he does for racing, what I do for racing. He was a doctor. Um, it was really cool. Like he, I was super excited to go to the opening ceremony. And I was like, oh, it's cause it's in a castle. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, like we see castles all the time. And then he's like, I forget the U.S. is so young and doesn't have any castles. Um, so you just kind of hear about their lives and like how their culture is different from ours, like how racing goes. Um, and then you try to stay in touch with them um, on Facebook or whatever, however you can find them. Um, then another thing, like at the end of the race, a lot of the people want the U.S. jerseys um, just because, you know, we're not over there very often. So they want the USA jerseys. So you can usually trade jerseys for any country you want. If you see a jersey that looks cool during the week, you find that person at the end of the race and they're 99% of the time willing to trade you jerseys. 
Uh, so like at that last one, I, I, I met up with the German guy afterwards and we swapped jerseys. Um, so now I have his jersey. I, I gave it to my girlfriend's dad because he loves Germany and he's got it hanging up in his man cave. Um, and That's like, cool. Or if you can find your number at home, you swap jerseys with them. So it's it's just cool, like kind of trading stuff at the end and trading experiences. That's great. It's it's so it's so cool how people connect when it, it's around like a common common theme or a common goal, and it's like all those all those barriers, all the politics, all the bullshit is just just goes pushed away. aside. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's really cool. Um, yeah, if you want to dive into a little bit of your three races, I'd love to hear about how those differed from one another. Yeah. So, uh, first one I ever did, um, I was 16 and that was my goal from watching on any Sunday was when I was allowed to qualify, I was going to qualify. Um, and so I turned 16, didn't have my driver's license yet, went to the qualifier, ended up making it and I left the qualifier. And the next, the next week I had to go get my driver's license or else I wasn't going to be able to go. Um, didn't know how to change tires. Didn't know how to do a lot of like a lot of the bike work stuff. Uh, so for the next five months, I spent just practicing, working on my bike. Got my driver's license. Got all this other stuff. Um, and I believe I'm the I, at least up until this year, I was the second youngest to ever go uh, for the U.S. Um, the only younger one was a guy named Jason Rains, who's like a legend in off-road racing, and he got his license like two months before. Um, wow. So I went that first year. My One of my teammates was also 16, a couple months older than me. Um, so that was really cool. Get there. Uh, I was a minnow, you know, in a, in a, a sea full of sharks. And it was, it was insane. Um, didn't know anybody. My parents, you know, we, we, we knew nobody. We didn't know how the race worked. Uh, a lot of people helped us out, kind of took us under their wing and, um, people from the AMA, they, they were really helpful. They're, they're all from Ohio. So we knew them a little bit from racing. Um, so they helped us out a ton. Uh, so yeah, we get, we get there, walk the whole first week. Our opening ceremonies is in the, uh, in Pamplona where they do the running of the bulls. Like oh, all cool. super cool stuff. Um, we we were in the the bull fighting ring and all that. So then we we finally get to the race. Um, I get going. Whatever I start at like seven something the first morning, and third special test of the first day, I hit a rock in the dust and got a super bad concussion. Um, but the first thing I said to myself when I opened my eyes was like, don't quit. Whatever you do, you cannot quit. Uh, so I get up, like finish that special test. And then right after that special test was one of our time checks where we got to like, you know, get back on time and do any, uh, or eat any snacks, whatever, kind of fuel up. And they're asking me if I was okay. And I just wasn't answering, you know, I, I didn't want to tell anybody how I was really feeling. Um, I was kind of like that my whole life growing up. Like if I got hurt, I didn't want to tell anybody because I didn't want to stop doing whatever I was doing. Uh, so I, I get up, somebody's like, Oh, your handlebars are a little crooked. I'm trying to kick my front wheel and hit my handlebars straight again. And you know, I'm missing my wheel. Like I'm like falling over. Um, now that I think about it. Like I, I definitely should have stopped, but, uh, I, I saw my parents and my, my dad comes up to me. And he's like, like he, he sees that I'm pretty messed up. And I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Like, I'm not quitting. My mom comes up and she like grabs me by the head and she's like, look in my eyes. And all I could th like remember is thinking to myself, like, I don't know where her eyes are. Like, I could not <laughs> find her eyes. And um, so they, like, they, they tell everyone for the US support team, like around the track that I was, I wasn't quitting. I was, I was gonna keep going. Um, so I, I get back on the bike, keep going. I'm like riding up to arrows to see which way they're pointing because they're moving in my head. Oh, no. um, finally, this, this is really stupid, but I finally make it <laughs> to another track where I'm getting gas. And I was like, I, I need to throw up. So I go behind the van, like 
kid that I threw up from everybody but one guy because I knew him. Um, he was like friends with my cousin, so I knew he wasn't gonna. I knew he, was, he had my best interest in mind. So like I, I told him, but like the second I threw up, it was like a light switched in my head and like everything was fine again. Um, I could see fine, felt fine, everything. I was all squared away. So I go to the doctor. I was like, hey, you know, I hit my head, whatever. Can I have some ibuprofen? Gives me that. I keep going, finish that day. Bad headache, whatever. Um, parents knew what was going, going on, but didn't really, like I wasn't gonna go around telling everybody. So I was like, all right, you know, day two, we'll, we'll feel better. Um, going to day two, head's a little, a little foggy, but I clear up and then I go in and the fifth test of the day, I go through a rut and my foot catches and turns my foot all the way around, like to the back of my leg. Oh, and no. it snaps back, you know, and I, I'm like, okay, that hurt. I think it just twists my ankle. Go a little bit further and I crash. When I go to put my foot down, it was like my whole leg slid on the top of my foot. And I was like, that's that's not good. So I, you know, hop on one foot, get back on my bike and finish finish the test. Um, once again, don't tell anybody because I don't want them to make me quit. And I was like, oh, it's it's, you know, what they say in miracle like foot's a hell of a long way from the heart you know i'm not gonna die so i keep going um and then the rain starts falling towards the end of that day and you know i was i was pretty upset as a 16 year old kid i was like man i screwed everything up these past two days now it's raining um get through the final test of the day get to the finish barely get my bike into impound or um and like have to use it as a crutch to push my bike in so then when I was walking out, like I, I was just gritting my teeth and, you know, fighting back tears because I didn't want to limp because I was scared that if somebody saw it, they were going to, you know, make me get x-rayed or something, and, you know, take me out of the race. So I basically just hid from everyone the whole weekend or the whole week that my ankle was destroyed. Um, had the doctor tape it up, all that, did did the, uh, the cortisone rub and all that stuff, was taking motion every day made it to the finish somehow, not really sure how, like I got done and I was, I've never been so exhausted in my life, just mentally exhausted from just gritting it out all week. But as a 16 year old, I was, you know, didn't really realize how cool it was until like now realize what you went through and you're like, wow, that was, that was incredible. Like I, I should not have been able to do that as a 16 year old. Like I shouldn't have done that from a, a smart standpoint, but it, it was really cool, and then the U.S. won their first the, for the first time in however many years. So that was like a cherry on top to finish my first one ever. Bike didn't break, body survived, um, and then the U.S. won, and it was it was like all hell broke loose. Like everybody was happy, crying. Um, it was just it was a super cool experience. And that kind of gets you addicted to it, no matter how bad it goes. Like you want to go again. So that's, that was the first. <laughs> that sounds like total hell. It's it's absolutely bonkers. Like how much it, it's a game. It's like a physical and a mental game. And if your your mind is strong enough or stubborn enough, you can just power through anything. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I assume you don't have any like head head issues now, or your ankles totally fine. Yeah. Just yeah. Like, no, I mean. I've had concussions following that, but nothing like concurrently that has added together or anything. Um, but like the, the other big thing that I didn't mention was I was a junior in high school and everybody just knew I was leaving for two weeks. Like they didn't know why. So then I come back and like, I'm limping around school, head's kind of hurting. And, and like, everybody just thinks I was on vacation for two weeks. And I was like, the amount of times that I, you know, could have died in the last, week of racing my dirt bike and like life just goes on so it was kind of weird jumping back into normal life like i just lived through something crazy like i have all these stories and you know <laughs> nobody's nobody really knows about it so it was kind of neat like you're, you're one of one at that point right that's awesome i i assume the rest of the the other two years he went went much smoother than that yeah yeah uh Chile was Chile was really good. Um, kind of my it was my first time in South America, first time 
racing in any condition like that. But yeah, it went well. Like obviously the highways were a little scary, but finished with a gold medal. Um, got to do the final motocross day, the sixth day on the beach along the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so it was unreal. Like went with my buddy that time. Um, we just we just had a really good time, no matter the circumstances that Chile provided. Uh, he did get robbed out of our car, so that was kind of wild. He had to stay extra days to get a new passport and license and all oh, this no. other stuff because his stuff got taken. But it, it provided so many good stories and like funny, just stupid stuff. Um, just bonding together, um, growing up, racing together, and getting to start a day of ISD together was unreal. Um, and then, yeah, Italy was, Italy was as you, you could imagine, like just the most beautiful country. Um, racing was good. He went again. So we got to go together. Um, his wife, my girlfriend went, so it was just like a, it was a big vacation with a lot of racing involved. Um, it was her first time overseas. So a lot of firsts for like that I got to show other people around for, which was really cool. Um, and racing went well. He got hurt, but I managed to get another gold medal, um, top five in my class. It, it was my best result ever. And in Europe, the competition's a lot stronger than South America. So it felt really good to put in something solid. That's remarkable. I When I think of, I've never been to Italy I've never been to Spain, but when I think of those countries, I don't think of, you know, areas where you can even dirt bike. So, yeah, I mean, I know it's, I know it's a pretty big country and there's a lot of spots that are not cities. So that's, yeah. that's interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Europe is very, uh, motorsports friendly. So like Spain and Italy, the, the hillsides that you're racing on, like, I don't know how people get out there, but they're out there and they're cheering you on. Like, if you're a USA guy, they, it seems like they cheer extra loud for you, which is really cool. Like they can be holding whatever flag they're holding, but they're going to cheer for you as you go by. Um, and like, I don't know, these people must take a week off work just to watch us ride and just follow us around. But it is, it's the coolest thing ever. They got chainsaws, air horns, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so cool. If, if anybody, anybody listening ever wanted to get into not not particularly that event but wanted to get into enduro riding like do you have any tips or recommendations for them honestly like the the best thing i can tell you is to just show up and make friends with the person next to you because 99 percent of people are willing to help you out if they're pitted next to you like a a friend is a friend. Like if, if you're riding a dirt bike, they're, they're going to want to talk to you. Um, they're going to be willing to help you out. Uh, a lot of times if, if they're starting at a similar time as you, like they'll, they'll carry gas for you. If you, if they have somebody who's taking gas around or supporting them. Um, so just showing up, asking questions, making friends. Um, that's, that's the biggest advice I have. Uh, as far as like on the bike things, I definitely recommend there's so many resources for like training now. Um, I would recommend that like taking some sort of a training class just to learn the basic fundamentals of like bike control. Um, you don't necessarily need to know anything about the racing as long as you can control your bike. Uh, you'll figure the rest out when you get there. But just being a safe rider is the only other advice I can give you. And I have to imagine that there's so many different, like there's the American Mot Motorcycle Association and there's, you know, groups and organizations in every state, mm -hmm. every country. So just like finding that, you know, starting the conversation is probably enough to just get your feet wet and, you know, yep. see if you get the itch. Yeah. There's a, uh, you know, all sorts of forums now. Um, the AMA is, you know, the, the overseer of everybody in the country, but there's districts for each state. So like, Michigan's District 14, um, Indiana's District 15, Illinois' District 17. Like it, it kind of goes from there, and like there, there is ways to get involved. You just kind of do your research and find groups, find Facebook groups, find whatever, and people will point you in the right direction. Awesome. 
Is there is there any shout outs or handoffs that you want to give? Is uh, where can people find you if if they want to kind of follow your story and the the different races you're doing? Yeah, um, obviously my parents uh, they've got me into this and got me hooked on it for life, which is you know you, you can't thank them enough for that. It's I look at you know other other lives and it it keeps you out of a lot of trouble as a kid if you're racing dirt bikes. You know you're you're so busy and it gives you something to focus on. It gives you a good goal to chase for uh, that you can you can have your whole life. You know you don't have to give it up after high school. You don't have to you know try to get a scholarship or something like that. Like you can take time off and come back to it. Uh, so I got to thank them. Um, my girlfriend rides with me uh, a lot of the time. She has a little bike, so we go out and cruise around, and it that that really makes it fun because I can involve her and. In, my hobby and just have fun like that. Um, then a lot of like, just a lot of the local people, uh, Lancy Motorcycle Club, Jack Pine, they've, you know, supported me in all my journeys to six days, um, giving me a place to ride as a kid. They do so much for the state of Michigan. Um, District 14, another great organization in Michigan, uh, which they have a thing called the Family Enduro Series. I grew up riding. Um, Mike Maurer and Tom Dunn started that. It's basically full full enduro, but shrunk down for kids to get into it. Um, so that's how they're kind of trying to grow the sport, and they've done a phenomenal job of that. Uh, they started just in Michigan. Now they're in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, um, and then other similar series have started elsewhere um, that are having huge turnouts and getting kids into riding, getting – you know, old guys back into riding, families riding together, all this stuff. Um, so that's really cool. And I owe a lot to them um, as well as just, you know, all the, the, the companies that have supported me in, in Michigan and around the country. Uh, they're all great and great manufacturers. And um, I have to give it up to Mobile Power Sports is one of the biggest ones that has helped me the past couple of years in Traverse City. Uh, just a bunch of buddies. They started a dealer, uh, basically a service shop. And um, I actually worked for them for a summer and a half, just helping them out. And now they're helping me out and they've supported me a lot in my racing as well as Enduro Engineering. They're another Michigan company that's worldwide. Uh, they gave me my first job when I was 16. Uh, the owner has done six days numerous times, owns the National Enduro Series owns all this this stuff that has gotten me into racing and you know given back to my life so much so those are those are the primary companies that have, that have helped me out a ton that's that's incredible yeah it's uh it's when i've gone up to jack pine it's it's cool to see the different age groups they try to get people in so early and there's a bunch mm -hmm. of old guys that have been lifers there that just go out yeah. and ride every time they're up there it's it's truly remarkable um Talon, this is great. I'll be sure to tag your Instagram page so people can find you and kind of follow along. Um, awesome. Thanks for thanks for sharing your stories and telling us about this event. Uh, uh, very impressive. Congrats on the two gold medals. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Appreciate this. Fun to do. I've never done something like this before, so glad you reached out and I could uh, I could get on. Thank you for listening to the Type 2 Fun Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a follow and feel free to reach out to say hello, give feedback, or share your Type 2 Fun story.